Hello, everyone from EdTech Team on Live or online. <laughs> it's Tracy Purdy. We're here this afternoon with Ramsey Musalam. Really excited that he can join us during our flipped and blended unit that we're talking about. Um, as always, remember that if you have any questions, that you can tweet them out, and um, then we'll answer those questions in live time as we can. So we're going to go ahead and get started with um, Ramsey. So Ramsey, I met, I was probably, I'm trying to think now, it was quite a few years ago. We had a years, yeah. superhero camp in Minnesota, and Ramsey came up, and um, I was blown away. I learned so much during his keynote and all of his session that it totally changed my teaching in my classroom. And so I was really excited to have him come on and share with you guys. So Ramsey, do you want to tell us a little bit about what you do now or a little bit about your background? Sure. I um, have been a science teacher. I'm currently a full-time science teacher at Sonoma Academy High School in uh, Santa Rosa, California. I'm in my classroom right now. See, beautiful, outdoorsy. Um, and for the past 15 years, I was a science teacher at Sacred Heart Cathedral in San Francisco. So I teach uh, honors chemistry, biology, uh, robotics, computer science, and I coach the robotics team as well. And I run their summer program as well. So I'm too busy, but that's what I'm up to. <laughs> Full time in the classroom. Um, and yeah, I love it. That's awesome. Well, good. So you, we, um, have had people go and watch your TED talk just so they can get to know you a little bit more and know who you are. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would love to start with what your definition, when you're thinking about what flipped or blended learning is, or which term do you prefer, flipped or blended learning? Um, what does that mean to you? Yeah, so I, you know, I'm gonna be really honest with all this because I think it's important that people hear this. I really don't like using either of the term. Um, and I think that, I've had the privilege of being part of this movement since I would say about 2006, 2007, ever since I realized a smart board could, re could record things. Um, and I've basically tried to implement every single version of you know, traditional flipped instruction where initially I recorded all my lectures online, students watched them for homework, um, you know, kind of your traditional offload the video as homework and then do the work in class, did that for a lot of years, did my dissertation for my PhD work on that specifically, um, and then moved to more uh, inquiry-based models where the, the video I'd put in the middle of the learning cycle, um, and then kind of arrived at this place now where I've realized that trying to adhere to one specific, even naming it, kind of puts me in a position where I feel like I have to vouch for something. And I feel like it really negatively impacted my pedagogy or my instruction. Um, I'd go in and say, okay, so I'm now the flipped instruction guy, so I better be doing this in my classroom. And when I finally let go of that, um, it's really freed me up to do real teaching and leveraging technology as more of a partner. And I like to think about it that way. I, I would say if I were to define blended instruction, it would be, you know, plan your lessons like it's 1934. And then where you find there's gaps and you're not doing well, you can enhance that by using technology as a partner in your classroom. Um, and then that's gonna open up doors for you. So that's really the way that I think about um, blended instruction. And when I show some of the stuff I'm doing, you might be able to see that. That's awesome. So then I would love to see, so what are you doing in your classroom to leverage technology to make that learning better? So I'll kind of couch that by explaining my journey in flipped instruction. I think that initially, um, if you look at the traditional definition of, of flipped, it was reversing where, when the homework and lecture occurred. So it would say, take the lecture, put it in the homework space, take the homework, put it in the lecture space. Um, and initially, I feel like we as educators had such a, and still have such a tumultuous relationship with homework. How do we assess it? How do we grade it? If we don't give it, we're not taken seriously. If we give too much, they don't like us. And there's that whole, that whole back and forth of how to deal with it in the day-to-day -day grind of being a teacher. Um, but then when I really sat back and looked at it, it, albeit it was providing a different way of looking at homework, it wasn't changing much. It was still a lecture-first curriculum. Um, 
it didn't really matter where the lecture was happening. It was more about when. And just because I was putting it in the homework space didn't mean that they wanted to watch it or didn't mean that they had any desire or curiosity about the information. Um, so when that happened, I got really thinking about, well, where can it fit within an inquiry model of learning? And if you think of a traditional inquiry triangle as explore, explain, apply, it really had me realizing that I was positioning the video in the wrong place that if I was going to record video lecture, the best thing to do would be to engage students with a perplexity, tough questions, um, open-ended labs, guided activities, uh, assessing where they needed me and then make the video in response to that. And I did that for, for many years. And now I'm at a place where I really feel like I am doing a lot of blended stuff in terms of the technology, but the video instruction, I wouldn't even consider myself a traditional flipped instructor, in, instructor anymore. Um, the video is kind of a side thing that, that's happening because it feels, I've found that when I try and spark student curiosity first, uh, fried uh, questions that contain missing information or scenarios where there's a, a gap in knowledge and ask students to try and figure that out, Sometimes their need for me then to jump in in the explain portion might happen when we're in class. And sometimes that might happen spontaneously while they're trying to figure it out. And I found that when I was trying to wait and put it in the video, it, it became inauthentic. That they're like, oh, he's now playing this game where he's gonna make a video for us and tell us all the information, rather than just go, oh, class, the bell ended, I'll post a video real quick, you know? And I find now that I think about my job that way, it becomes more of a fluid thing. So what I'm doing in the classroom now, I'm gonna, I'm gonna share my screen for you. Um, and I'll kind of walk through the way that I'm structuring my class with respect to blended stuff. So the first thing that I'm getting really uh, excited about is um, everything in my class happens on a website and I'm using the new Google Sites for my website. I used to use Weebly, but I'm loving that you can make a website right in Google Docs, which is really great. So um, we have a class website and that contains all the lesson plans and everything we're working out of. Um, I'm not using a traditional learning management system at our school. I'm just using this website. And I do that so colleagues at other schools can also use the website. So here, here's the class website, and if I were to go to it, it looks like this. And you'll see um, the first thing is all my students' names. So these are all my biology students, and these are all my chemistry students. And I had each of them make their own Google site as well. And at the end of each topic of study, they post a portfolio that describes their work. And I do this in lieu of lab reports or um, you know, formal homework checks. They then demonstrate everything they learned and what they struggled with. Um, they haven't made one yet, but I can show you because we're in our second semester right now. But if you look up here in my chemistry class, we have six units. And if I pull up a student's website, like let me pull up, let's say Emma. You can see here's Emma's portfolio. And if you can see Emma has six tabs up here as well. So she'll make six posts throughout the year of her learning. And I put these right on the front page. I believe in the students sharing their work, it being public, and I think that really ups the ante. So um, that's one way I'm using a, sort of a blended model. Students are creating online portfolios. I used to use Blogger for this, but I switched to Google Sites because we have a, a Google Suite account at the school. Um, and then if you went into the website, you can go right into what we did today in class. Uh, you can see that I have the standards up here, what we're learning, and here's sort of the inquiry model. We started off on day one. The students walked in. I showed them this picture. I asked them the question, what do you think creates the different colors above? Then we went through an activity in class. This is in their notebook um, where they tried to figure it out. And then they shared their hypotheses in this Google form. So this is another example of technology. Um, and as you can see here, I'm asking for their names, what their hypothesis is, and then I'm using the new feature in Google Forms, which I really love, where students can upload a file or a picture, which I think is really great. So that's sort of the inquiry model. I'm trying to get an idea from them of what they know, what, I, what they know, what they don't know about this phenomenon. Um, 
So then you can see their homework was to finish up doing that. And then today in class, this was actually today, they came in and we studied that again, looked at a clip from Harry Potter, and then we went and re-reviewed re their hypotheses to try and pull out some trends. And I'll pull up that spreadsheet here. Um, you can see everybody's response is right here. And these are their pictures that they uploaded. And it's really great. It just uploads a link of their picture or video immediately to the spreadsheet. So we went through and we try and teased out some ideas. Um, one thing I, I did is I copied all of these and I put it in a word cloud generator. I like to use WordSift because it, it works on any browser. Put those in and what came up was sort of this cloud where students thought perhaps there were different energies of the electrons. Maybe their ionization was related, some number of electrons. And we talked about this idea. At this point now, this is where the direct instruction would come into play. And as you can see in the website, that's where then I gave them some notes and we did some practice problems. Um, we then did some work in class and they went home and have tonight these four problems to do. And if you notice, it says click here for a helper video. So that's where the flipped piece comes. Anything they didn't get from class, they can get from this helper video. Um, I have a whopping seven views on it right here. So you see kids probably got what they needed from class. But now here's the offloaded piece. Um, in the past, this would be the first thing they saw. Now, if you notice, we teased out everything they knew using a combination of the Google Sites, the Google Forms, um, the Word Cloud Generator, and then now they're gonna go home and watch this and help them work through those problems. They're gonna come in the next day and then we're gonna apply that to a new scenario. So the workflow was really activities contained in this Google Site using forms to gather information and then pushing out videos that are sort of tagged along on the side. If you notice, the video really is not the focus at all. It's literally spackle to fill in the gaps rather than the paint itself to use a metaphor so that's awesome i love seeing that and i think that this is a really good model for people to get their heads around to think about that flipped learning there's not necessarily a set formula for it that when you're thinking about flipped learning maybe we just think about how are we going to support our students with technology within the learning process Mm -hmm. um, I, w I wonder if you would talk to us a little bit more about sparking the student's curiosity. Sure. Um, if you, there's a lot of research on what curiosity is right now from a cognitive perspective, but I think it, it's one of those buzzwords that actually does have a, a foundation in the research, and that's why I really love investigating it and thinking about it more. Um, I'm actually going to be coming out with a book that comes out mid-May that unpackages my TED Talk, where I, so I'll get in that book, I'll get into the research on that really um, uh, in-depthly. But if you look at the research on curiosity, um, it really defines curiosity as the presence of an information gap. So not just an information gap, but the awareness of an information gap um, within the recipient. Um, if you think about it on a plot of uh, knowledge versus curiosity, it looks like an inverted U. So if you have all the knowledge about something, you're not that curious. So giving them the video with all the information up front. If you don't have any knowledge on it, you're not that curious either. And there's this, this sweet spot, this intentional withholding of information where you're, uh, you understand your students so well that you know how much to give and you know how much to hold back. And when you have them at that spot, the irony of it is that's where their max cognitive efficiency is found. Like when you have them there, they can negotiate complexity better than they could at either end of the extreme. So the trick is how to make that gap salient. And the research talk, talks about a lot of ways. One way is simply providing something with some information withheld. So I do this by taking a video and perhaps downloading it and putting a box over something or removing the sound. So they see the phenomena, but they just don't get the whole picture. The follow-up question might be, well, what are they saying? And then I will be, well, what do you think they're saying? And then that leads into an activity. Um, another very typical thing is to provide a scenario where you stop it early. Um, so, you know, you could have, in, in chemistry, this is really easy, but you could have any sort of phenomena that is occurring and right before resolution occurs, you stop it. The immediate question is, well, what happens next? And you say, well, what do you think is happening next? 
Um, and the, and the, the final one that the research talks about is this idea of something that's so shocking and surprising that the phenomena itself sparks an information gap. So you might give them all the information. Um, some in humanities class, you might be talking about a book, but there is some passage that is so shocking and so profound and so uh, intriguing that it alone um, creates, sparks a conversation about its true meaning. So uh, removing information, um, creating some sort of sense of anticipation and um, trying to curate really surprising events are things that can make that gap really salient. And at that moment that it's really salient where they're not demotivated um, on either end, you have them in a position where the direct instruction can really flow in very easily. That it's more of a responsive thing rather than a directive thing. And I really like to think of that. Think of, I love lecture. I just don't think it should be the first thing they experience. The trick is then what comes first. Um, and that's where a lot of the, the strategies around sparking curiosity can come from. And on my website, cyclesoflearning.com, if you go to resources and Uh oh, perfect. I hope that hopefully that last part it didn't cut off for other people. Um, Cyclesoflearning.com, you said, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And if you just search, you go to the blog, you go to, go anywhere on the site and just search for curiosity. The the literature will come up. That's awesome. I think that that will really help people start to mold some of their lessons that they're creating around flipped learning. Awesome. Um, Ramsey, really, really appreciate you coming on. Does anybody have any questions? We'll give a second to see if anybody has any live questions right now. If not, people will be watching later and hopefully you won't mind if people do, if they have a question, if they tweet it out to you and um, we can get back to them at some point. Awesome, no problem. So, um, let's see if there are any questions that come in and I think that we just really appreciate everything, Ramsey, that you've said. I think that we have a lot of work to do building that new model of learning, and it looks different in every classroom, and it's so great to see what you're doing in your great. classroom. Great. Thank you very much. So, and your uh, one question that came in, people were just saying most of the tools that you're using for holding your students accountable are things like Google Forms and Google Tools and their Google site, it looks yeah. like. I forgot to say one thing that I do often, if there's a video that I really want them to watch, I'll actually put the video directly inside the, a Google form. And that's very easy when you make a question, just say insert video and then find it, um, just insert the URL. It'll embed it right in. And then below that, I'll have them write a summary of the video and perhaps answer a few questions to, to get them get kind of a meta thinking about the video. So in the video I just pulled up, there was no, um, direct accountability because it was more of a helper video. But sometimes, especially if I'm gonna be gone, I'll put it right in the form itself. Um, that way you don't have to deal with them going to a different piece of technology to reflect on it. They can do it right there in the, in the form. That's awesome. Um, so the other question, I mean, I know that you're in a high school science mm -hmm. classroom, but with all of your research that you've come across or people that you've talked to, um, in an elementary classroom, do you feel like the same approach would be effective? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. My, I have, you know, my kids are in elementary school, and I think especially at the primary grades, like this is so already happening. I mean, teachers are, it's almost like you have to engage students and work in centers and, and uh, individualized instruction and all that kind of stuff is almost like, natural, I feel like, to some of the early elementary school teachers. Um, yes, I mean, especially since I'm not uh, really assigning or depending on videos. Um, I've seen a lot of uh, my colleagues, I have a colleague that I work with who uh, is at the fourth grade level, and he has a sort of a direct instruction center where he has some videos uploaded, and he'll do the sort of that initial curiosity spark field questions from students engage them and then some students who figure it out on their own will go to one area where they can explore it some more and those that need more information he'll shuttle over to this other corner and they'll they'll gain some more information and work with him i, I definitely think so i mean you have to you have to know your students in your classroom and and structure it differently but basically the whole thing i'm talking about is just not 
making the direct instruction component the first thing they experience. And I think my thesis is just because it's in a video doesn't mean that it's that much more engaging. Um, Very you know, true. <laughs> Very true. It doesn't make it any different if you're just yeah. saying the same thing in a video. But mm -hmm. unless you figure out how to spark that curiosity, that's awesome. And then somebody else just was asking also about um, your classroom structure in a chem or in a science classroom. Um, is it mainly is your schedule centered around the video assignment or mostly about around like a lab activity? Oh, absolutely around the, the lab activity. Uh, I, I plan my lesson according to an inquiry learning cycle. So, um, I mean, you could think about it like you could use any cycle. Let's talk about like, the five E learning cycle where you start with like um, in a, a moment of engagement. So that would be they walk into class and I showed them the picture of the fireworks and I asked them what they thought about where those colors came from. We surveyed those questions and then I had a lab set up where they got to experiment with it a little bit. While they were doing that, I'd walk around and drop some, some subtle information on them. You know, I'd say it's gotta be about the electrons or something like that. They then provided that hypothesis to me, the period ended. We came back the next day, I surveyed their responses, um, gave them some brief direct instruction on what was really happening. We did some practice, they went home and I gave them a teeny, teeny video, it was like seven minutes long and it wasn't even required. They came in the next day and we kept extending that, ultimately leading to um, a concept in chemistry related to uh, whether something's magnetic or not. So it's, so there's, it, there's a cycle that involves withholding information, giving information, applying that information, and at subtle moments, there might be a video here or there, you know? And I did the exact same thing with AP Chemistry. I felt like when, I'm not teaching that this year, but when I was at a place where I was teaching, and I taught it for about 10 years, I really, really worked hard to make the lecture component feel a little bit more authentic, albeit it was kind of harder in AP Chemistry when it was so complex. It was never about the video. It was always about the inquiry and the questioning, and the lecture was, was subtly delivered in response to that. That's taken me a long time to figure out how to do that well. Um, so. Well, we really appreciate, Ramsey, you coming on and sharing with us. Um, I think it will be really helpful, and hopefully we can all go out and spark some more curiosity in our students. Cool. We're looking forward to your book coming out in May. Yeah. You'll have to do that. Send it out to everybody here. Yeah, I will them. post it. I'm excited. All right. Take care. Awesome. Thanks. Bye, everybody.